In the fall of 1979, Frank Zappa released Joe's Garage Acts 1, 2, and 3, a satirical rock opera that centers around the story of music being outlawed by the government. As told by robot-like narrator, the central scrutinizer, we see the life of Joe in his terrible downward path for choosing a career in music. The album sold very well and continues to be one of, if not the most popular of Zappa's works. The excellent band no doubt plays a part. And it's an unbelievable pleasure to talk to one of those excellent band members today, the great Arthur Barrow. Arthur became a fan of Zappa's in the 60s and later became his bass player from fall of 1978 through 1980. The very first album of Zappa's that he played on? Joe's Garage, of course. It was a unique recording session overall. As Zappa described it, they went into Village Recorder's studio in April of 79, looking to record the title track as a single, along with its B-side, Catholic Girls. Zappa, ever the opportunist, noticed a sort of continuity and wrote a story to accompany it. And by early June, he had three sides of recorded material. Before I got a copy of it, talking to him on the phone, he says, well, you're not going to believe what this turned into. Because once I did the basic tracks, I didn't. I came back once or twice, once to, he wanted me to replace the bass on the song Joe's Garage and use my, my uh, my precision bass instead of the jazz bass I used on everything else. And then there was the guitar parts for Joe's Garage that Warren and I recorded together. It was kind of weird. We had a, I think they took two amps, one for each of us, and put a microphone in the middle of them. He and I were doing this stuff like the do 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 the wipeout lick, you know, and the deep, the re to re to re to re to re to re all the guitar parts, but uh, he forgot to give me album credit for that. Oh well, that that happened. I don't, I'm sure it wasn't intentional, you know. So anyway, but after doing the, the basic tracks and those little over ups, I, I wasn't around for the rest of it. You know, he started putting the vocals on and the, over, the keyboard overdubs and the Ed's overdubs. And when it came out and, you know, it's this like all of a sudden it's this sort of rock, I hate this term, but like a rock opera, like a theme going through the whole album. So I was pretty blown away with that. Of course, the great lyrical work is obvious, but there's a lot on the album that's worth discussing. Like how he repurposed old material to fit within the story or how he used live guitar solos over studio backing tracks. And it may come as a surprise that parts of it were band member contributions in the studio. For example... Catholic Girls, he asked me and Vinny to come up with the, the odd time part for the, the middle section. We, we wrote that, um, but of course we didn't get credit, but didn't really expect that. But the funny thing about it is we got to the end of that section and went back to the vocal, the regular part of the song, we did it, and Frank liked the track, and he was happy with everything, and then Vinny comes over, he whispers to me, he says, Audie, Audie, I've missed that first backbeat coming out of the middle section. Do you think I should tell Frank? And I said, nah, he likes it. And so if you listen to it, when it comes out of that, there's missing a snare drum on that first two. And Zappa also developed most of this material by dictation to the band. Like? Well, Packard Goose is my, my best example. It's got, you know, all that, maybe he thought it uh, was a pack of goose, da, 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 da. So he just, like, he would, like, bring in, he had to have the lyric sheets. He loved to type, and he would type them up real nice, uh, the lyric sheets, and bring copies for everybody, and would just start working for that. You know, and Packard Goose, he probably had the basic idea of, maybe you thought it was the Packard Goose. But other than that, you know, no, no real chords or anything. We just kind of figured it out and never stopped to think, okay, it's a bar of 2-4 and a bar of 5-8, and then a bar of 7, you know. It's just, like, it just goes with the words. You just learn how it feels and how it sounds. But was there any written material Zappa brought in at all? The only written out things in all of Joe's Garage were the chart I created uh, for Lucille Messed My Mind Up. Frank gave me a cassette of the Jeff Simmons version and I just made a lead sheet for that. And the insertion unit in Fembot for a Wet T-Shirt Contest. Ah, Fembot in a Wet T-Shirt. Contrary to how it may come off, it's not a celebration of the spectacle. In fact, the entire song is built as a parody that, in Zappa's words, captures the whole essence of the event. So, how did this tune come about? I didn't go, but the guys went to, other guys went to, with Frank, to a, a wet t-shirt contest at a bar in Florida. So that's where he got the idea for it. It was my first tour, so it was fall of 78, but I didn't see wet t-shirt on any of those set lists. So I looked in the next tour, 79, and it was on there. It's my favorite track on the whole album. Not because of the reasons you may think, although I did get into Zappa at a formative age. It's got a super interesting form. The biggest part is a straightforward vocal section. But of course, there are some really neat other things. 
For one, in keeping true to the spirit of the album, Zappa repurposed material from other pieces of his in here. Do you know what the, where that, well, it's wet t-shirt time again, I know, you know what that's from? That's right, the opening lick of the monstrous Mo and Herb's Vacation. Now for round two. You know the lick that goes din 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 Do you know what that's from? The answer is the unreleased Saddlebags. I know I think it serves a ride. That lick was from a song that he worked on and never finished working on it in early 1979 called Saddlebags. I think that was maybe one of the few things from Saddlebags that survived and became part of a song. There's two verses. There was and then there was a variation that it goes. And all those those muted guitars thing because there was three guitars at that point. There was Ike and Warren and Denny, and they doing this muted kind of two chord things, making this kind of cool Stravinsky like texture. And then Tommy on his uh, French horns, and it... And I think Frank maybe used that lick somewhere else, but it's all a very long time ago. There's also, of course, a long Latin section, featuring dialogue between Zappa and Dale Bozio, that runs straight through into a guitar solo, and then why does it hurt when I pee? After the, you know, big one, what went, big one, when it goes to the down, that little Latin thing, he said, well, just, you know, play the, I'll cue you when to go into Why Does It Hurt When I Pee, which was all recorded in one chunk, by the way, you know, with that, it wasn't edited together. So I start coming up with this little sort of deep jackal, do, 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 and I think, oh, it's probably going to be like, you know, what, 16 bar or something like that, and then he'll give us the cue. But it just kept going and going and going, and I thought, I should have, I wish I would have come up with a simpler <laughs> lick. And so I think I started getting real tired by the time we went into White as Her when I pee, and it's like, oh, God, thank God. Now, all of this to say, as interesting as all of that is, it's still not why this is my favorite off Joe's Garage. I know you all clicked on this video to hear me talk about my personal favorites, of course, but seriously. It's because of the wild 31-bar instrumental interlude that appears about a minute in. It's totally Zappa to take a normal tune and have a section of what sounds like completely random and strange melodies thrown in, but we're going to take a look at what's actually happening here and dig deeper into his compositional techniques. It's a piece where we have to navigate wide angular melodies, dense harmonies, and plenty of odd time signatures. And just as an overview, as always, we can draw similarities to other Zappa pieces like the famous chromatic compositions, pieces like the Bebop Tango, Manx Needs Women, or Moe and Herb's Vacation. And it's obviously similar to Jumbo Go Away in concept, a short piece of music that interrupts what is otherwise a normal song. Well, it's pretty common for him to use these types of interludes. I talked about this in my video on the Jumbo Go Away interlude, which is so closely related to this that I referred to them as sister interludes. Fembot, like Jumbo, comes from a specific set of interludes Zappa composed he called inserts. What he did is he would, uh, it was one of the few like written out parts, but he would give us these insertion units. You know, there's one in Jumbo Goes Away and, you know, other places. And uh, he would just have us just, you know, work those up and, you know, get them under your fingers or so. And, and I'll, I'll find a place to put it at some point. So that's what it was. So he decided uh, that a wet t-shirt would be a good place for insertion. What was it? Eight? And, you know, stuck it in there and it worked. So, yeah, that, that's what those were. We don't know all the inserts, unfortunately, but we know some. Like number two, which was used in Alien Orifice and Drowning Witch. Number six, which was used as the Jumbo interlude. And number nine, which eventually became Outside Now. Our Fembot insert is number eight. And as you could expect, since they were written in a row, Number six, number seven, and number eight share a whole lot of similarities. We'll get into all that, but first let's hear number eight as performed in Fembot in a wet t-shirt.
That little drum break section is so cool, I wish that had made it to the record. I asked Arthur if they actually did record that part, only for Zappa to edit it out later. It almost sounds to me like there could be an edit, since the crash symbol sort of cuts off unnaturally. No, I, he just changed that. Well, fair enough. And speaking of drums, just from looking at the score, you're probably wondering why even though it indicates a lot of odd meters, it sounds like a lot of it's in 4-4. Well, that's sort of a simple one to answer. Everyone plays as written while the drums play in 4-4. So the song is pretty straight ahead, you know, just the, the vocal part. And then the insertion unit, the, the difficult thing about that was, it, on its own, it was, you know, it was something you had to get under your fingers. What he did that, he, that was new is that uh, he had Vinny kind of play a disco beat in 4-4 four, four over the top of it. So you got all these time signatures you're having to deal with, but, you know, having the 4-4 four, four go across the top of it. So that made it kind of challenging. It's a big difference between, what was I been by then, uh, 28, 29 years old, than being 70. You know? <laughs> this leads to some really neat, unintentional accenting, where things that would normally be beat one feel like beat four, the and of four, beat three, the and of three, so on and so forth. But why did Zappa decide to do this? Oh, just a, a, a whim, probably, you know, just to... <laughs> change it up and and you know uh disco was all, all the rage then you know and uh maybe it somehow fit into the context of being in a, a wet t-shirt contest you know because they were probably playing disco in the bar there i would think it's weird it didn't really throw me at the time but when i like i said when i went back to do it recently it's like ah oh, fuck <laughs> it just made me crazy Maybe, like the Black Page, he enjoyed the idea of people dancing along to this disco beat while a wild chromatic line glides over top of it. And as always, even in 4-4, there are some ridiculous performances from Vinny Kaliuta, like this Hammersmith Odeon rendition, where Vinny flips the quote-unquote beat. Before I got into the band, I thought, yeah, I got pretty good time, you know, I got a good sense of rhythm and all that stuff. And, and then I played with Vinny. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> I see what it really is. <laughs> so that was extremely fortunate that I got a chance to play with him and extremely challenging. Some of those solos and, you know, Vinny and Frank are just going and Fred, Vinny's going all all over the place and you know he he wouldn't like give you a, like a solid one at the end of four bars or anything like that you know it would just kind of keep going and, and there was a couple of times when god bless his heart i of course he didn't have to play he's just you know listening and watching and it, but he's like kind of grooving and tapping his foot there was a couple of times when i would like uh-oh i'm lost <laughs> I could look over at Ike and he just smiling and tapping his foot and I was like, oh, okay, there it is. <laughs> but seeing it in an odd time, as Zappa wrote it, actually illuminates quite a bit. Let's start right at the top and I'll show you what I mean. In the first two bars, you can see both phrases have the same exact contour. Up, up, down, 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 down. Wouldn't have been able to tell if that was 4-4. Four, four. And actually, they're the same notes, but transposed. Right off we get B, C, D, C, B, A, G, and then the next bar is down a whole step. Now A, B flat, C, B flat, A, G, F. Another thing is that you probably weren't expecting the line to look like this, meaning straight eighth notes, because it doesn't exactly sound that way on the record. It's played with embellishments by Warren Cucurullo on electric guitar and electric sitar. Here you can see and hear what Warren plays against what everyone else plays. Rhythmically it's 16th triplets in the first two bars first on beat 4 and on beat 3 in the next bar, and they're the same melodically, C, D, C. It works because he's starting on the same note as everyone else, and obviously in the first one it's coming right back from that D note. In the third bar it's two sixteenths on beat 7, D, E. Now the way we're counting these in 7 is 2, 2, 3, as in 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. But we should talk about how to approach odd time and Zappa's music as a whole. Well, for one thing, um, you could pretty much count on if it's it's a if it's a five, whether it's a quintuplet or a five eight or five sixteen, it's almost almost always going to be one two one two three, and if it's a seven lick, it's going to be one two one two one two three. 
in fact, me, me realizing that, um, I think, helped me get, me get the job when I auditioned. He, he liked me and said, well, you're not quite hired yet. I want you to come back for, you know, and by the end of the week, I'll, you know, hire. I think I put this in my book. But um, And then a couple of days after that, before the end of the week, he brought in a stack of sheet music for us to read through. And, of course, Vinny's a fabulous reader. I'm a not fabulous reader, but not bad. But I think the edge that I had over, you know, he had, like, Berkeley guys that come in there, and they can just blow the 60, but as soon as they'd see a quintuplet or a 5-8 or a 7-8, they, they'd choke. They wouldn't know what to do. For me, it was like normal. You know, I'd say, here comes the 5-8. It's got to be 1-2-1-2-3. You know, and you're, okay, it was. And, and so I could go through that stuff. And I think that maybe Frank thought I was a little bit better of a reader than, than I actually was. But I could read his stuff. I knew how his brain worked. There's a whole bunch of seven in here, and this count applies to every bar until the last one of seven. Although don't get too comfortable in that thinking for all of Zappa's music. He'll get you with a 3-2-2 two, two every once in a while. Now we're right away establishing that this is chromatic and not adhering to a certain scale or tonality. There's no set harmonic functions applied in a tonal sense. Although there are harmonies that we'll discuss later. If we're trying to figure out specifically what's happening here, well, they are the first five notes of the major scale starting on the third. And it also kind of reminds me of a specific sound that Zappa does use often, a major triad with the fourth added, this time with the second as well. Bar three here starts with the same contour of up up, although these three notes are built as whole half, as opposed to the half whole of the last two, G A B flat. And from there we see the first interval that's bigger than a step, B flat up a fifth to F. In these chromatic pieces by Zappa, it really helps to look for the intervals that he really loves to use, like minor seconds and its inversion, major sevens both major and minor thirds, or perfect fourths and its inversion, perfect fifths. After this B-flat to F, we see it go down a step in the opposite direction, E, A. It's not the first time that Zappa has used this segment of minor seconds of fifth apart. It's how he built the main riff of Filthy Habits. You can see that they're even played the same way. So we go up a fourth from A and see another step down. D, C-sharp, with that C-sharp landing on the next bar in the new time of 5-8. You can see from the way it's beamed, but the way it's counted is 1-2-1-2-3. One, two, one, two, and that will also continue for all 5-8 measures. So overall, in these two bars, we see three minor seconds. A to B-flat, F to E, and D to C-sharp. And we move back to 7-8, as it starts B, A-sharp, G-sharp. Also interesting that he starts both phrases on B. At the top, he immediately moves up a step to C, and now again he moves immediately down a step to vary it. After that, we jump down a third and see three chromatic notes in a row, E, E-flat, D, as it jumps down another third to B-flat. Notice that this is the first bar that has one contour, just down. The next bar starts with another jump of a third, although minor this time, to D-flat and we see another half step, to C. From there, it's a fourth down to G, and we see more chromaticism, G, G flat, F, E, and then again, ending with a minor third down to D flat. Well, I should mention there are times where an interval may be an augmented second or diminished fourth, for example, but I refer to them as thirds. I know this is technically incorrect, but since it's a chromatic piece, I think the sound takes way more importance over the notation, since Zappa could have written this any number of ways without losing any melodic or harmonic function. And he actually did between the charts for Fembot and number eight in some places. All right, so there's two takeaways now. One is that we're starting to see these smaller rows of chromatic notes, and two, is that he uses both major and minor thirds to pivot from one group to another. I talked in my Jumbo video featuring Brett Clement that Zappa doesn't really use 12-tone rows. Instead, we'll almost always see smaller chromatic segments. Brett coined the term for this as chromatic saturation. It's a trademark of Zappa's chromatic works, such as this interlude. The goal isn't to get all 12 pitches in there, completing the aggregate, although that can happen. Sometimes it's as small as three notes, and we can see them in any order or octave. It starts out straightforward here and will get increasingly dense as we go along. The first example we need to look at, of course, does not come from Zappa himself, but from his hero, Edgar Varese. In the piece Octandra, the opening oboe melody starts with a four note chromatic run of G flat, F, E, D sharp. You can see the F is down an octave or displaced. We see some isomelic variations as it appears two more times. And then the row continues as we see D, C sharp displaced, C, B. And now you can see the entire row, eight pitches from G flat down to B. Of course, in Zappa's music, it runs from four notes like Alien Orifice or Gregory Peccary.
five, like time is money. Or six, like the Eric Dolphy Memorial Barbecue. Once we get up to 7 through 12, we can find them in the especially thick chromatic pieces, like Manx Needs Women, Bebop Tango, Moe's Vacation, Pedro's Dowry, or Bob and Dacron. We'll even look at a few more as they pop up, but the main takeaways are that it's heavily featured in its chromatic pieces, and it can appear in all shapes and sizes. So as I mentioned, in these two bars, he uses thirds as a pivot between the small segments. This is in line with the bebop tango. You can see so many phrases end with thirds. We'll encounter many more, and actually we see this very sequence from measure 14 of bebop tango. F, E, C sharp. Down a whole step as D flat, C, A. The major seventh and minor third both being very important sounds as we've established. Along with the minor second, which we see now from A to B flat, and the fifth, which we see from B flat to F. And then again, a minor second and fifth with C, D flat, A flat. And then, once again, now in the next bar with E, F, C. Clearly important as a motif he sets up and transposes first by minor third and then by major third. Well, it's a huge part of another tune written a few years later, Markson's Chicken. Now it's reversed though. We see fifth, then minor second. E, B, C, G, A flat, E flat, and back down. Three pairs of fifths here. How about the intro to Dupree's Paradise, which is built off this segment? And what about his arrangement of Dupree's off The Perfect Stranger? Well, the piano interlude, one of my favorite things Zappa has ever written, also features it heavily. He also hints at this back in the third bar with A, B flat, F here. So, there's clearly something to be said here about recognizing patterns, not just in Fembot, but in Zappa's music in general. It'll certainly help us navigate all of this. Mark Pensky told me that Frank told him that I, ha I had the best pattern recognition of any musician he'd ever had, which surprised me, I mean, really, compared to Vinny. And, and, but uh, supposedly that's what he said. And so I could pick up things real fast from him. You know, he'd like, you know, he'd have his guitar and he'd show me a lick and I'd, I'd be able to get it right away, you know, and, you know, learn. And, and then... <laughs> what happened was, and then a half hour would go by, you know, and he says, okay, remember that lick I showed you? And I just blank. It's like, <sighs> and he plays it, oh, yeah, 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 okay, I remember now. <laughs> and it would just, it would evaporate as quick as I recognized it. But the interesting thing was that then I'd, you know, go home and sleep on it, and the next day I'd, I'd have it in a permanent memory. It was like as if, it was in, you know, it, had, it was, had to be moved from the temporary storage of my brain to the long-term storage of my brain. You know, like you would on a computer, it's, you know, it's, you're actually saving it somewhere. As it lands on the last sequence of C here, we see it go down a step to B, up a whole step to C sharp, and down a minor third to A sharp. Well, that looks like chromatic saturation to me. A sharp, B, C, C sharp. This same sequence was used in bebop tango, starting on F sharp as F sharp, F, G, E. And he also uses this chromatic segment to great effect in the Frunabulac section of Cheapness. He also used it in Moe and Herb's Vacation, this time with the same exact notes. As this ends, we see a minor 6, an inversion of major thirds, down to D. Well, that could even keep the row going. Now A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, with the D displaced. And now in the next bar of 3-4, we see the D up a step to E flat, and, well, you guessed it, that keeps the row going too. Now he goes up a second to F and repeats that again, E flat F. From that last F, he starts this new idea, where the pitch of the second eighth of the previous beat will begin the new beat. So you can see F here on the and of two, and then on beat three, G flat on the and of three, and then beat one of the next bar, F on the and of one, and then beat two, and then E on the and of beat two, and then on beat three. You don't have to know a lot about Zappa's music to realize repeated notes are huge. And actually, we only see four notes in these two bars, E flat F, G flat E. Well, that sounds like another out of order chromatic segment, which we could rearrange as E flat E F G flat to see that it is. And since we already knew that E flat could continue the saturation we saw in the previous bar, that means we can link it with these two, three, four bars. Now we have an entire segment of nine notes in order as A sharp B C C sharp D E flat E F G flat but played here as C B C sharp A sharp D E flat F G flat E 
How awesome is that? And as we leave this segment, what does Zappa use as a pivot? A minor third, of course. F to A flat on the downbeat of the next bar, now in 5 8. From there, it's down a fourth to E flat, and we see all minor seconds the rest of the bar. E flat D, D C sharp, C sharp D. Well, besides being a chromatic segment of C sharp D E flat, look how it's constructed. Just like in the previous 3 4 bar where we saw G flat F E F, a three note segment that goes down, down, up, and repeats the second note of the group, we get the same thing with the same exact contour. As this phrase ends and we enter a new bar of 7-8, we again get a minor third from the last note of D to F in this new bar. We see F to E-flat immediately, two pitches he's dabbled with considerably in the previous bars. From that E-flat we see a major 6 down to F-sharp, the enharmonic of G-flat and the inverse of a minor third. And from there, a minor third to A. These exact four notes as a harmony actually open up the bebop tango. The fembot interlude is sort of in the same tradition to the bebop tango melodically, although just about the inverse rhythmically. So even though it's probably unintentional, I do appreciate the shout out. Okay, so from that A, we jump up a major seventh to G sharp, see a minor second down to G natural, and a second to A. From there, it jumps down a minor ninth to B flat as a sixteenth, and back up a major seventh to return on A. Now this segment in particular looks pretty chromatic. G sharp, G A, and putting that minor ninth in there, B flat, gives us some more chromatic saturation. This formation of minor second, major second, and minor ninth is something we see in approximate, and actually it's the same exact notes, with A flat, G, A, B flat. Now I'm not saying he thought, I'm going to quote approximate here, but man that's still really cool, isn't it? And another that I'm not sure many people would guess, but played by Ruth on Vibes in the Quaalude Thunder arrangement of Pygmy Twilight. And guess what? We can even add in that F-sharp on beat 3 of the bar of 7, now giving us a row of F-sharp, G, G-sharp, A, B-flat, but played as F-sharp, A, G-sharp, G, A, B-flat. And of course, if we finish a segment, we have to pivot to the next bar with a third, this time an enharmonic minor third of A to G-flat. Now back in 3-4, we see G-flat down a minor second to F, down a minor 7 to G, up a third to B, up a major 7th from there to B-flat, down a minor 7 to C, and up a major 6th, minor 3rd inversion, to A. Alright, those pitches sound pretty close together, and judging off those wide intervals, we could easily guess there's some chromatic saturation here. Right off we have G-flat F-G. Well, there's a three-note row right there, played with the first two notes reversed and the last displaced down an octave. Something similar, but not exact, appears in Manx Needs Women. Now what about the last four notes? B, B flat, C, A. Well, rearrange that to get A, B flat, B, C. So now we can see these bars are two segments, and what's even cooler is if we go back a bar you'll notice Zappa utilizes two segments that contain the pitch A in them, and he lands on them for the last note, although the majority of the other notes are different. It's a really fun way of playing with your ear by getting to the same destination twice from different chromatic paths. Okay, so now that we've reached the end of the quote-unquote disco section, let's hear these 16 bars again, knowing what we know now. And just for fun, I'll set the sparse rhythmic accompaniment to accent it as written, and not as 4-4, so you can really hear how it navigates the odd times. God, after listening to it on the record for so long, it's really strange to hear it that way. It's like putting emphasis on the wrong syllable, you know what I'm saying? But really, it already feels a bit overwhelming. So what was it like being in the band and having to manage hours of this music? Tommy Mars and I talked about it and he had the same experience during that time, especially when it was like so intense and we were learning so much new stuff and writing, Frank was writing so much new stuff. I, when I'd drive home after rehearsal, it felt like my brain was spasming inside my head. 
I could feel it moving around or something, and it was weird, kind of. And I learned after that that, uh, if I understood it correctly, that all brains look alike when they study a, a brain after a person dies. You know, whether you're a lawyer or a garbage collector, you know, they all look alike, except for classically trained musicians. People who've spent a lot of time developing that, they have this sort of bridge that goes from one side of your left brain to your right brain. And it's this thing that, that grows in there as you're, you know, c focusing on music so intently. And Tommy Amar said, oh yeah, I had the same thing. Anyways, that brings us to a new time, 716. From the previous note of A, we move up a minor second to B flat and down a major second to A flat. Now we see it go down to E. From there it's a minor third, now E to G, then up a minor sixth to D sharp. Now on the last three notes, we see D sharp a minor seventh to C sharp, and down a minor ninth to D. Well, there's a row right there, C sharp, D, D sharp. In this form, it also appears in the bebop tango. And as you could guess, we have a minor third to pivot us out of this row, as we see D to F, and then funny enough, to E flat. We see this exact sequence happen in bars 12 and 13, as it comes out of the 5-8 bar to 7-8. Again, D, F, E flat. That E flat drops down a diminished 12th, just a tritone plus an octave, to A. From there we see a minor 3rd to C, and then two major 7s, C to B, and B, B flat, where it goes down a minor 3rd from B flat to G. Well by now we've learned major 7s are an indication that we've got some saturation, and starting on A, we do. It's played here as A, C, B, B flat, some pretty gnarly leaps. The row is A, B flat, B, C, though. From that G, we head down a minor ninth to A flat, and we're back in 5 8. And immediately we get more jumps, now a major seventh up to G. So, what is it exactly with leaps and wide intervals in this music? Well, that sounds like Zappa, you know? I remember learning in music school, it's like, you know, there's a few little tips if you wanted to, like, sound modern. You can use a lot of leaps, you know? Da, 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 lends it a sort of more modern and less classical kind of sound to it, you know. For the first two bars, we see the same thing rhythmically. Quarter, dotted quarter, or the clave of the bar, basically. One, two, one, two, three. Now in the next two bars, after he's established this new motif, he gets to play around with it and add variation. First off, rhythmically, you can see it's different, but only where the dotted quarter on beat 3 would be, and the next quarter note on beat 1 would be. So keeping the outsides the same, but changing the middle. First, it's just a quarter and an eighth starting on beat 3 here, basically just playing the dot of that dotted quarter we saw previously. Beat 1 is that quarter divided into sixteenths now. Sixteenth, sixteenth rest on beat 1, and then two sixteenths on beat 2. Notice going back to this 8th on beat 5 of the previous bar, these are all staccato, literally meaning detached, so we play those notes very short. And melodically he makes some changes too. Starts like the first 5-8 bar with that A flat but glisses, or slides up, to G, now on beat 3. And then he does the opposite in the next bar. Stays on that G for the 16th and then back down to A flat. It feels like this chromatic seesaw the way he keeps teetering back and forth between those two pitches. It's so much fun. It looks a whole lot like Sad Jane, another piece that fluctuates between two pitches, a major seventh apart. But now we gliss up again, this time to a new note and a new time signature. The time is 7-8 and the note is B-flat. Now we see it as a 16th triplet and then a quarter, occupying beats 1, 2, and 3. Then another 16th triplet where the first two 16th stay on B-flat, but then head down a minor second to A, and up a major second to B-natural. We've seen that interval sequence before, a good indication of more chromatic saturation. While going back to the 5-8 bar in total, we've seen A-flat, G, B-flat, A, B. The row is G, A-flat, A, B-flat, B. So that B ties over into a new bar of 2-4, another Zappa favorite. And we see an eighth triplet and then a quintuplet, both occupying a beat each and all on that B, with more staccato. Two observations about this. One is that the rhythm is really getting varied now from all those eighths we saw as he began the interlude. The overall shape of this is really looking interesting, and if I didn't know any better, I'd say he's working us into the climax of the whole piece. The second, it's very interesting to me that he uses a quintuplet and a bar of 2-4 occupying a whole beat instead of in any of the odd time bars. I don't know if this is something you've noticed, and I kind of alluded to this when I made the bebop tango comparison, but Zappa for the most part keeps odd time signatures and odd numbered tuplets pretty separate from each other. 
I wouldn't be surprised if he viewed them as two sides of the same coin in a way. Different ways of getting the same intended effect. Except for the still unreleased first movement of Sinister Footwear, I haven't found many examples of him merging these concepts together. I'm sure there's an obvious one that I'm missing and you all know much better than I do, so please remind me if you can think of it. Not that we need to highlight this as some crazy important compositional trait, but it's common to see Zappa use one note repeated, varying that rhythm. Eat that question comes to mind. Or strictly genteel. And of course, alien orifice. One last interesting thing, in the chart for insert number 8, at this point in the interlude it goes back to the top and repeats the first 16 bars we've already heard. And this actually makes sense, as you can see, it both starts and ends on B, along with the same bass note, but we'll talk about that later. Alright, so we have 7 bars left, the climax of the interlude. And well, we only have to really look at five of them since, check it out, the first two bars, measures 25 and 26, are an exact repeat of measures 17 and 18. Our analysis applies again to these bars, obviously. Also, it's neat that he still keeps the third bar starting on A flat like he did previously, keeping the minor ninth over bar lines. Now this measure, just contour-wise, looks exactly like the first two bars that open the interlude. Up, up, down, 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 down. And hey, intervallically, it's the same as well, but starting on A flat, up a step, up a whole step, down a whole step, down a half step, and down a whole step. But now on the very last note, what was another whole step down is now a half step down, making the bar A flat A, B, A, A flat, G flat, F, instead of what would be E natural there if he had kept it the same. Well, for one thing, it just sounds cool. It's sort of a diminished sounding pattern. But look at the first note of the next bar, E. So we see three notes in a chromatic descending row, G flat, F, E. And now on this E, Zappa starts a new sequence. E up a fourth to A, a minor second to B flat, then up another fourth from there to E flat. It's not uncommon to see Zappa take one interval, move up or down a step, and continue that sequence. We've already seen two examples in this video, like Markson's Chicken, where we see a fifth, up a step, fifth, up a step, fifth, or Bob and Dacron where he uses major third, down a step, then fourth, down a step, and repeat. And in Moe and Herb, where we see major seventh, minor second, major seventh, for the first four notes of the beats here. So we see another major third here, from E flat to G, then another major third to B, and a minor ninth, down to C. You can see he largely keeps contour the same on the last three notes of bars of 716, this up-down thing. And from that C, we get a major 6 up to A on the next bar. Then A up a step to B flat, we see a major 6 from B flat down to D flat, and from there up a major 7th to C. Now as I mentioned earlier, this is the only bar of 7, where Zappa beams it as a group of 3 and then a group of 4. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2. This C starts the last group. C down a 4th to G, where we see something familiar again. G, G flat, A flat. This minor second down, then major second group we've seen a bunch. So we get this chromatic row and then, is it getting old yet? We see a major third down from A flat to E in 2-4, where we again see this minor second down to E flat and a major second up to F, although he finishes the row with the minor ninth down to G flat. Again, the same row like we've seen in Approximate or Pick Me Twilight. From that last note of G flat, it now leaves up to A flat, we see a quintuplet in 2-4 again instead of odd time. And in that quintuplet, we see A flat down a step to G, then down a fourth to D, where for the third time in two bars, we see it down a step and up a major second. D, D flat, E flat. So again, here as G, G flat, A flat, here as E, E flat, F, and here as D, D flat, E flat. And now we're in the last bar, just two notes. Down a minor third from E flat to C, and then up a major seventh, fitting, as the last interval, to B. Alright, there's definitely chromatic saturation going on here. We know the minor second down and major second up is already three notes. D flat, D, E flat. Then add the last two notes of C and B to get B, C, D flat, D, E flat. Well, what about that A flat and G? Maybe if we combine with the row of the first four sixteenths. E flat, E, F, G flat. Well, that's a perfect fit. Now E flat, E, F, G flat, G. 
And that, of course, means the entire last two bars, 10 notes in total, is a chromatic row, and the longest of the entire interlude. All 10 notes played as E, E flat, F, G flat, A flat, G, D, D flat, C, B. But the row is B, C, D flat, D, E flat, E, F, G flat, G, A flat. Man, what a genius. Ah, oh, I just love that. And I know this is written as a triplet, which may seem weird. I think it's actually played closer to this rhythm. But anyways, that finishes the melody of this. And now, let's hear it all again. But wait, there's more. Like Jumbo, the interlude has a unique harmonic element to it. For one, it's scored for Polybox, a 13-key controller used as an interface. It created polyphonic chord memory presets, so you could construct chords that were saved, and track the pitch on another synthesizer, and then play parallel harmonies. This was part of that awesome crazy rig for Tommy Mars. I mean, he just had such an arsenal of cool shit up there, you know, this great analog stuff. You know, he had a Fender Rhodes, one of those Yamaha C CP70s, and the B3 and um, CS80. Tommy was so great on that, and um, his EML with the with the Polybox and the Sin Key. God, it just, it just made it a lot of fun. But like I said, Zappa in this insert utilized parallel harmonies tracking a single pitch. This is called planing, where a single harmony moves in the same exact direction. And again, like Jumbo, they have the same chord that's tracked throughout, a major triad where the top line is the third of the chord. And you don't have to write the full harmony. Zappa even came up with a little inscription that tells the player how to set it up to get parallel chords. So the score for Fembot still has the single line. Insert number eight, however, has the triads written out in full. I talked about this with Jumbo as well, but it's great how even if you take a simple harmony like we have here, taking it all over the 12 notes and using interesting rhythms can make it sound completely foreign. A beautiful aspect of his music is what he's able to accomplish with just simple concepts. He certainly doesn't make them sound that way when he wants to. So now we'll talk about the bass line. There are times where it seems like Zappa has established something harmonic and then adds the low voice to really spice it up. Not that I think this interlude, or any other, comes off in a disjointed way, just that I would guess he didn't come up with it all at once. I would guess he came up with the melodic line first, and then he can pick and choose the bass notes to make it interesting with the triads. I think this is an important feature of Drowning Witch, for example. But we'll talk about that another time. I promise. Taking a harmony and then adding a bass note can radically alter that sound, as Zappa does here. This gives us slash chords, showing us the regular chord and then the bass note. I know this could be kind of controversial from a theoretical standpoint, but since there's technically no harmonic function for any of these harmonies, I think it's okay to look at them as if they're over pedals, so we won't have to worry about flipping back and forth between calling something C over A flat or A flat major 7 sharp 5, just for example. So this would be a great opportunity to hear from the bass player himself. How does this bass line lay on the instrument? Well, not too bad. Um, you know, most of it was, you know, no, no big deal. It's just, it was, it was somewhat difficult, I guess, being in 7-8. Those, those dotted eighth notes and stuff that go across the bar. But once I got used to that, it was no, no problem. Uh, it was a little, it was a little uh, hairy when it gets to the 16th notes at the end there. I'll go ahead and admit it. You, you probably know this too, or maybe I don't. But when it got to the end, I dragged a little bit on some of those notes. I can't remember exactly where. And whenever I hear that, it, it's like, ah, oh, fuck, oh, God damn it. <laughs> but, you know, Frank never noticed it or anything, and so it was okay. Yeah, the, 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 there's some intervals in there. Yeah, that's probably the, the hardest part, I'd say. 
Yeah, it's not terribly hard. So let's go through looking at Zappa's bass note choices. Just in the first two bars, it's easy. All C. Now there are harmonies that we'll encounter that are basically inversions, like A flat over C because C is the third of A flat, or F over C because C is the fifth of F. So what does that leave us with? Well, it starts with G over C, an important sound like we talked about, as he sort of implies it over the melody, over these two bars. As a single harmony, it shows up everywhere, and is used heavily in jumbo as well. We also have B flat over C, a sus sound. In my jumbo video, I use Dancin' Fool and Yo Mama as examples of this harmony, and Montana is another great one. E flat over C and any slash chord, with the triad a sixth away from the bass, will give you a minor 7 chord. And D flat over C, or any triad a step up from the bass, will essentially give you a major 7th with the 7th in the bass. Although if you're thinking of that as the root, it can definitely invoke Phrygian a bit. That leaves us with the most pointed and biting of slash chords. G flat over C, a triad with its tritone in the bass. You may recognize this sound, like from the ending of Jesus Thinks You're a Jerk. It's used in another Zappa piece that was definitely written around the same time. Insert number 7. And that makes sense, since it's written back to back with Jumbo and Fembot. We see it here, 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 and finally here. It's a heavily used sound in Fembot. We're going to see it a bunch more. Bars 3 through 5 start with some neat contrary motion. Beats 1 through 4, the melody heads up with the triads E flat, F, G flat, and D flat, while the bass heads down C, B flat, A, G. G flat over A is a new type we haven't seen yet, a major triad with its minor third in the bass. This is the first and last time we'll see this slash chord. But again, notice we get those slash chords with a triad and its fourth in the bass like F over B flat, and a triad with its tritone in the bass, like D flat over G. It's going to be so hard to get through most bars without seeing both of them, let alone just one. And on B5, another new slash chord, C over B flat, a triad with the flat 7 in the bass. Although knowing Zappa and his preference for Lydian, I think it would make more sense to view it as a 2 chord with the 1 in the bass. I used the example of Andy in the Jumbo video to illustrate how Zappa uses this sound. Now you can see something neat he does here is pedal that B flat as we see this movement through the cycle, with C to F to B flat. And as it gets us our first plain first inversion triad with straight up B flat here, he cleverly keeps the bass B flat into the next two bars to give us A over B flat now. This was, far and away, the most used sound in the jumbo interlude, which, if we assume the bass to be the root, would be a diminished major 7 chord, certainly another that's used all over Zappa's music. And although it's not as important in Fembot as it was in Jumbo, we're still definitely going to see it. And since the harmony just ties over in these two bars, he can play with the bass rhythmically for the first time. Bars 6 and 7 have a really neat motif. Each time we see triads moving down a step, he places the bass note so we get the slash chord with a fourth into the slash chord with a tritone. Check it out. We see G over C to F sharp over C, B over E to B flat over E, A over D to A flat over D, and D over G to D flat over G. This is not a coincidence, people. It's a bass line that's working with the harmonic planing to get the sounds that Zappa wants. And it's these two specific sounds he goes for the most. And we'll continue to see this throughout of Zappa specifically putting these two together. Other than that, a new one we see is E over C, another way of writing a major 7 sharp 5. Another harmony used in Andy. And we'll see it a couple more times. And again, from bar 7 into bar 8, we see the 4th slash chord into the tritone, as we see again. A over D to A flat over D. F over D gives us D minor 7, and A flat over C is an inversion. Other than that, we get another tritone slash chord with G flat over C, a fourth slash chord with A over D, and the Lydian one with E over D. Bar 9 sees C over D flat to start, and as the triad moves up a step, the bass moves down a fifth to get us D flat over G flat, the fourth slash chord. Then he keeps it while it moves to A flat. This is the second time in a row we've seen him keep the bass on this three note pattern that we talked about earlier. First on beats 6 and 7 in bar 8, A flat over D, then E over D, and now the same up a major third, D flat over G flat to A flat over G flat. 
one more fourth slash chord in A over D, and then one more tritone slash chord in B flat over E, which ends the bar. Bars 10 and 11 are really interesting. We only see four triads in these two bars of 3 4 B, C, D flat, and D. Right away, you can see he pedals C in the first bar through B1 of the next bar, giving us B over C, D flat over C, and D over C, but with an interesting harmonic rhythm. Twice we get triads repeated in a row D flat over C twice, then D over C twice. But notice how he cleverly changes that the next time. Now we see D flat twice in a row, but C, then G flat in the bass. And since we see the fourth slash chord, guess what? He keeps it there since the melody is down a step, giving us the tritone one now, C over G flat. And again, since the C triad is repeated, he does the same thing. Keeps that bass note for the first one and switches the next one, now C over F, then ending the bar with D flat over E flat. The next bar he pedals A, giving us E, B, B flat, A, then B flat again over it. Next bar sees G for the first three beats, and we get the tritone slash chord and fourth slash chord separated by the major third one. Now we get some more cool contrary motion. As the top voice moves from A up a major 7 to G sharp, the bass moves from G flat down to F, giving us F over G flat to E over F. Same slash chord quality. Bar 14 flips between F over G flat and F sharp over C, two of the most intense slash chord sounds, but still gorgeous to my ears. The next two 3-4 bars see only two bass notes, C in the first one and B flat in the second. Notice once again the fourth to tritone slash chord motif here, on the and of two to B3. Another thing I really like is how he changes the slash chord between this F triad and this F triad. I mentioned before that it was really creative to end both phrases on A with different chromatic rows, but I really like how he ends them with very opposite sounds. The first on the diminished major 7 of F over G flat feels tense and leaves the phrase feeling a bit unfinished, but the F over B flat he ends on makes it feel pretty resolved. It's so clever. Alright, so we've reached the 716 section. We can see the rhythms are pretty similar. Two eighths, three sixteenths, then two eighths and a dotted eighth, reinforcing the two two three count of these bars. Since it's eighth notes in the bass and we see every sixteenth in the melody, that means we'll get two triads with the same bass note twice. F sharp over B, E over B, C over F, and E flat over F in the first. Then D flat over E flat, B over E flat, F over B flat, and A flat over B flat in the second. The first bar in particular is 4 of the 4th slash chord. We even see a cleverly hidden 4th tritone, with B over E and B flat over E hidden, with A over D in between. In the second bar, he just outright does it. G over C to G flat over C. Then bars 19 through 24 are really fun. The first 4 bars, as we already discussed, alternate between 2 notes, G sharp and A, meaning it's alternating between triads E and E flat. And F is a really good choice. It gives us a diminished major 7 slash chord of E over F, and the sus slash chord of E flat over F. A very tense sound to a more open floaty one. Really, it's just a great back and forth of tension and release. I mean, I get that it literally isn't resolved because it's a sus chord, but you know what I mean. And we see something sort of similar, at least in that Zap plays with the opposite sounds again. And you can probably guess which ones. As we hit G flat in the harmony, the bass moves down to C, giving us, well, you know. We quickly get F over C before landing on G over C for the rest of the bar, getting the tritone slash chord to the fourth slash chord, with F over C stuck in between again. All right, so we're back to 716 again, the last seven bars. And just like we talked about in the melody, the first two bars are a repeat of earlier, so no need to review. As we get to bar 27 though, we see some familiar things. We already talked about how it's recalling the first two measures in a couple of ways. Well, that holds true in the bass as well. In the first measure it pedals on C, and now on A for the entire bar. And it's basically a minor third down, starting the entire thing with G over C and now E over A here. Bar 28 sees all fourth slash chords for the first four beats. C over F, F over B flat, F sharp over B, and B over E before three of the tritone slash chords, E flat over A, G over C sharp, and A flat over D. Have I uh, mentioned yet that he likes these slash chords in particular? Bar 29 is completely parallel. It's all sus chords, F over G, G flat over A flat, A over B, so on. And then as we move to two four on the last two bars, we get tons of the tritone slash chord and fourth slash chord. Just three bass notes, F, G, and A. Starts with the 4th on C over F, and down a step to B over F, and now the bass moves up a whole step, along with the triad, to make it D flat over G to D over G. 
And now that pattern continues as the bass again moves up a whole step to A, giving us E over A, and of course, down to E flat over A. So you can see the pattern he creates by how he places the bass notes. Whatever the second harmony is, it moves up a whole step to start the pattern again. B over F to D flat over G, and D over G to E over A. And that A lasts a beat, pedaling under the quintuplet. We already know this E over A, which moves to E flat over A, B flat over A, straight up A, then B over A. And now for our last bar. What else could we expect but A flat over D, the tritone slash chord, to G over C, the fourth slash chord, and a fitting ending, the two most used slash chords of the entire interlude. These last two hits on G over C feel like such a great exclamation, like a ta-da, and really sticking the landing after navigating this whole crazy thing. And hey, nice symmetry, as it begins and ends on G over C. So why don't we hear it all one last time, knowing everything that's happening in this interlude. And with that, we're all done. You know, looking back over this, it's so impressive how it works on both micro and macro levels. The unique application of chromaticism, utilizing harmonic planing and adapting the bass line around it. There are unbelievably creative things that you wouldn't know about unless you stop to take notice. He, he was just amazing. He was just full of musical ideas and, and he worked so fucking hard too. He busted his ass and, and nothing seemed to to bother him, we, you know, if we were in the airport and waiting to get on a plane and we're all, you know, oh, look at that girl, oh, you know, whatever, you know, and uh, and Frank, he'd sit down, he always carried his uh, briefcase with him, he'd open up the briefcase and pull out some sheet music, right, and just start writing music right there in the airport with all the noise and chaos of it, just kept plowing through it no matter what. He just had an incredible work ethic. And he didn't get discouraged by things, you know, if he lost his record deal or whatever, the band fell apart. He just kept going no matter what. You know, he was not going to be discouraged from being Frank Zappa and keep cranking out music. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you can follow me on Instagram at Tyler Bartram. And feel free to suggest any other tunes you'd like to see a breakdown of. And just a huge, huge thank you to Arthur for being in this video. I can't say enough great things about him and his incredible musicianship and insight. Not to mention, patience with my silly questions. As far as his stuff, you should check out. I don't know. Yeah, go buy my book. People still buy it and like it. And I've been putting out some of my own stuff, um, a couple of new things, and then some things from years ago that I had never finished and thought, well, maybe I can you know, do make some improvements on this and make it good. There's another one that's going to be coming out called Cool to Be. And I, I just decided, you know, I've done four albums and, you know, CDs and thought, well, fuck, I'm 70 years old. I really want to do another whole album. And I thought, no. I, so I just really, what some, a lot of people are doing is just, just putting out singles, basically. And so I've been doing that. Yeah, I, uh, I'll just say I've been incredibly lucky in my life, you know, uh, been able to be a prof professional musician most of the time. And, um, and getting to be in the band with Frank was just unbelievable. You know, I was so lucky that I got that gig. It really, you know, boosted my career and uh, really, really uh, blew my mind. Um, uh, that was an interesting experience. And God, I just learned so much. But uh, yeah, amazing time. So I was extremely, extremely lucky to have gotten in on that. Thank you all again so much for watching. I'll see you next time. <laughs>